begin to look at charismatic. So it's fallen to me to introduce this theme. Now, just to say, there are going to be lots of resources coming your way. You've already had a book, Naturally Supernatural, and again, plugging this from the front, we really want you to engage in it. We're not going to tell you how to engage with it, but we're going to tell you it's a fabulous book, and we suggest that it might lend itself to discussing with someone else. So if you look at the back, there are questions for you to think about for each chapter. And I think Juliet will be sending out various sort of um, uh, copies of that discussion material, but we'll tweak it as well, depending on what we've talked about on Sunday. So it won't be exactly the same as what's in the book. Um, and obviously, Sunday mornings, we're going to be looking into this theme, and it's massive. All of these things are massive. So what I need you to do is identify now in your brain everything that you think you know about this term and just park it again just, to, just take it all and park it somewhere okay if i don't say the thing that's on your shelf someone else will say it in a few weeks time okay so what i don't want this morning is a whole queue of people saying well you didn't say this about charismatic and you could have said that about charismatic because it's going to take us weeks to cover this topic, okay? You're going to give me permission to speak freely, but not to your agenda, because that would be really, really helpful. Good. So, dictionaries. When you get a big word, is there anybody who's never heard the word charismatic before? So we've all got some idea, we've got something parked on our shelves, haven't we? Um, uh, one hand went up. Okay. So, dictionaries, always a good place to go. So hit it, Angie. Dictionary definition of charismatic. Exercising a compelling charm which inspires devotion in others. I don't remember which dictionary it is. It's the Oxford something or other. The Oxford Online Dictionary, I think. And of the many examples that it gives, it clearly describes Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Charming. Fascinating. Magnetic, mesmerizing, captivating, appealing, hypnotic. I could go on, there are many, many more words there. Um, oh, it could be number two. I was so grateful that this was in the Oxford Online Dictionary. An adherent of the charismatic movement in the Christian church. Now, you don't need me to tell you what is wrong with number one, because number one, is not how we're using the word charismatic. So let's just have a quick look at number one and then chuck it out in the bin. So you've got your shelf here with all your preconceived and existing knowledge about charismatic. That's fine, put it on the shelf. But you've also got a bin, right? So in the bin, dump definition number one. Just dump it. Because definition number one is all about me. Isn't it? It's all about that person who draws people into them. I'm looking at Ian Johnson here, I don't know why, but draws people into themselves. And that has a place in the world. Um, entertainers are often described in terms of uh, being charismatic. Some teachers are amazingly charismatic. They can just hold the attention of a class just in their own person. Some politicians can be described as charismatic. In fact, the most common adjective used to describe Adolf Hitler was charismatic. So can we just put this definition in the bin where it belongs because it's number two that we're exploring. What does it mean to belong to something that's called a movement? Charismatic movement. The first thing it means is it's not the property of any one church. So this is not like belonging to Holy Innocence and declaring that I'm a member of the Church of England. It's not like um, going to um, the URC and declaring you're part of the United Reformed Church. It's not about being a Baptist. It's not about being a Catholic. It's not about being a member of the Orthodox Church. It's actually a movement within all the streams and denominations of the Church. Because it's to do with the workings of the Holy Spirit and the emphasis 
that a person chooses to place on him in their work, in their understanding of how their faith works out. Okay? So that's what it is about. So hit it. <laughs> it is therefore part of the non-denominational worldwide charismatic movement. And the expression of a uh, church that we're going to join, Pioneer, considers itself to be very firmly located within that worldwide movement. Now if you want, I've been pondering this all week as to where to begin and what scripture to begin with. And I thought actually begin with, <laughs> with Jesus. <laughs> That's a really good place to begin. So I'm reading this verse from John 14. So if you've got your Bibles and want to look at it, it's John 14, verses 16 and 17. And Jesus says this to his disciples. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, or helper, or encourager, or empowerer, because the word Jesus uses there is parakletos, and it can mean all of those things. I will, he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive or accept because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he abides or lives with you. And you will be, and sorry, and will be in or among you. Those are the alternate possible translations of the original Greek. So the charismatic movement is a worldwide non-denominational movement, which if you can trace in church history, and we will perhaps do that at some point or other. I'm not going to do that this morning. That's on the shelf, okay? Um, when the church became, if you like, suddenly aware of something that they had forgotten. It sounds almost unbelievable, doesn't it really, if you think about it, that the church had become an organisation, an institution, which had forgotten it was Trinitarian. Father, Son and Holy Spirit had for many churches and many Christians become just a phrase, just a word. And I'm going to say, although sometimes we sing this word and we read it in older translations of the Bible, I think the phrase Holy Ghost kind of didn't help much <laughs> in that regard. So if you like, what it was, was a rediscovery of this promise. Who wouldn't want God to reside in them on a permanent basis as a helper, encourager, advocate. Seriously, that is an amazing promise of God. So we're going to dig a little bit more deeper over the coming weeks into all of that and what that actually means for us and what that can mean for us because there is always something more to discover. Remember your shelf? Push it along and make a bit of room because there's always something more for us to learn, isn't there? People of God say, yes, a mm -hmm. the preacher here. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. Good. So we're part of Pioneer, we're joining Pioneer, and there is a video uh, which talks about the charismatic and what they understand about the charismatic, and we'll make that available to you. But I was listening to it for the second time, on, on, or third time on Friday, um, and in it, Linda Ward, who runs um, Bless Church in London, um, she's on the National Pioneer Core Leadership Team, and she said these two things, and I thought, oh my goodness, those are quotes you need to write down. So I had to freeze the video and go back again. This is what she said. Um, being charismatic is about a life and faith informed and energised by a living experience of the Holy Spirit, both individual and corporate. I personally think informed, energised and living are the kind of words that kind of burst out to me from that. And then she goes on to say, 
We believe in a God who breaks into time and space by his Holy Spirit. Now, just on its own, just let your brain think about that for a minute. Think about what we have. You know, we preached about God and the names of God, and we only scratched the surface. And we had all of that stuff about God that we were trying to get into our, into our minds, our brains, and our spirits. That God, who the scripture says is holy other, holy and other, holy with an H and holy with a W, holy other, that God chooses to break into the system that he set up. Does that make God a hacker, Tom? Mm. I don't know if that analogy will hold up. Discuss later at home. But God breaks in to time and space by his Holy Spirit, bringing revelation. Revelation, revealed truth. So everything you think you know that's true is revealed by God. But there's still more. <laughs> There's still one never settled. There's always more books you can squeeze into a bookshelf. And healing bodies. Healing bodies. A God who through his Holy Spirit brings healing. Physical, emotional, mental. Sharing spiritual gifts. We'll talk at more length about that term because it's an important one. Sharing spiritual gifts. The emphasis for me, there is sharing, <laughs> using what God has given us together, and performing miraculous signs such that the only response is, wow, wow, we could never, I could never, only God's Holy Spirit can have possibly done that. Sounds good to me. I'd quite like to be part of a movement that emphasises those things and I'm seeking affirming nods and heads <laughs> online and offline. Thank you. So, we come to our Bible reading. Um, the Bible is another example, move it on then, um, another example of a spirit-breathed revelation. Um, Timothy tells us it's God-breathed, it's spirit-breathed, the whole of scripture is God's word to us, okay? Should be the first book on your shelf and the last book on your shelf, the kind of bookends to what you think you know about God. Uh, and in terms of um, teaching about the Holy Spirit, um, you know, the, the fact is there are loads and loads of passages and I couldn't possibly reference them all. But if you're feeling up to it this week, here are a few key passages They'll be referred to in the book, Naturally Supernatural, over and over again. And I'm sure that as Tina preaches into this, as Angie preaches into this, as Juliet preaches into this, these are passages that will get referenced. So you can get ahead of the game if you want by kind of being familiar with them. John chapter 3, John chapter 16 and chapter 20, Acts 2, pretty much all of Romans, <laughs> 1 Timothy 4, 14, fabulous verse worth looking up. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6, again, another great verse. Um, 1 Peter 4, verse 10, so if you're into just verses, those are all great verses about God's Holy Spirit and the way in which he gives his church. And, uh, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And that's where I'm going to actually focus this morning. So I'm going to ask Ian to come up. And um, if you want to look in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, we're going to read the first 13 verses. Concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God 
ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between Spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these spiritual gifts are activated by the one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as a body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ, for in the one Spirit we were all baptised into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Amen.
the way of God's enemy. So just put the world's way of thinking to one side and measure it against God's word, what God has said to you in Jesus. Because it's through the spirit of truth that Jesus said he would reveal himself. This is a call for us to be naturally supernatural, not weird. Naturally supernatural means quite simply the recognition that God speaks. And what happens, usually in my experience, when you teach about something, is all of the people in the meeting who um, resist teaching will shut down their spirit. And um, for someone such as me, with the gift of teaching, that's quite difficult. So I pray that anyone here who senses resistance to scriptural teaching needs to go beyond the package by which it's coming and do some serious conversation with God about what it might be in the teaching that you are resisting. Profitable conversation could then be had. Naturally, supernatural, God speaks. He spoke already this morning um, with Julia exercising one of the spiritual gifts, listening to God and responding and saying what she believed God was saying through the candle that I uh, lit for a kind of parallel, complementary purpose. And you ask people to imagine that they have picked up, what was it? To hold Litter. up their hands, to receive the oil. Yeah, to I was rid uh, of, the, of, the, the crud. The, of the crud. I think you used the word crud. Um, the litter and the rubbish and replace it with the light of God. That's beautiful everyday image, isn't it, that we can all fasten on to. What she doesn't know is that on Friday, when I went out for my walk, um, when I said to God, how can I deliver this teaching without getting the backs up of people who don't like teaching, but that's my job, so I've got to do the teaching, you know. How do I actually do that? And he kind of said to me, well, it'd be really, you could tell them something about the way in which um, you craft you and I craft the, the worship together. And I said, brilliant, okay, well, I'm going to go out for a walk. Um, I'm not going to show you, share with you this morning all the things he shared with me. I think they're for other times. That's discernment in operation. Um, but I want you to show me really quickly one of the things that you're saying to us. So I walked along and I got to um, oh, about halfway through my walk and ahead of me, I saw a lovely lady, an older lady, um, and she got a bin liner in one hand and one of those litter picking up sticks in the other hand. And I stopped and I thought, darn, my pedometer's going to think that I've collapsed and died. But I stopped because that moment I knew that God wanted me to stop and talk to the lady. So we had the conversation, which goes along the lines, no, I'm making this up in my head. I don't really think you want me to talk about anything to this lady. I don't want to talk to the lady. Don't make me talk to the lady. She's busy. Look, she's picking up litter. Hello, said I to the lady. You're doing a good job, said I, thinking, encourage, encourage. I've got no idea why God wants me to talk to her. Um, I actually had a picture that I was going to put on the screen at this point of the lady litter picker. So that's just how meaningful what Juliet said was to me. Because it affirmed what God said. Tell her that God is using her. Tell her that I am using her. Tell her that I'm pleased with her. Tell her that, I'm doing, that she's doing some amazing work for me. And so I, by that point, I'm like, okay. you know. And so we had the conversation. She then offered this statement. I go to St. Mark's Church. And they keep banging on about being green and looking after the planet. So I thought, when I go up to the church, because I'm the cleaner in the church, that I could pick up some rubbish when I go. Then we have a conversation about people leaving rubbish, but you know. And then she said, 
And they were also talking about doing a community fridge. And I was thinking about volunteering. I mean, come on. And, you know, God wanted her to take her concern about the crud that she saw on her daily wall. She's a cleaner. She's called to clean stuff up. And she was about to discover that God's got a whole lot more stuff for her to help clean up. Now, nobody was healed. I didn't speak a word of knowledge over her. I didn't prophesy over her and and I didn't speak in tongues over her, some of the other gifts. But my goodness, that was God working his spirit in me through her. And then on Sunday morning, the prompt by Juliet Cat. Why did you take that image of the litter picker out of the pathway? Because it's actually really important. And it's really important for another reason. We so easily discount ourselves if we're not doing the dramatic. We kind of think, because we're not doing the big, cheesy, wonderful, spectacular gifts, that somehow the Holy Spirit can't use us, isn't working in us, somehow we're, you know, inadequate. And I think that... Paul really wanted to make it clear at the outset of his teaching, don't think like this, hit it Angie, because this is what he says. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. What did you say to each other 20 minutes ago? You may not realise it, but unless the words couldn't come out of your mouth. You all said to one another, Jesus is Lord, the basic Christian statement of faith. Now this might be controversial to some, but it's not controversial to me. Jesus says he will give us his spirit. No professing or confessing Christian is without the Holy Spirit. You can say, Jesus is Lord, the spirit is in you. Do not diminish the small things. Oh, I'm just a cleaner. No, no, no. Being part of the charismatic movement is not to buy into dictionary definition number one, the extrovert, <laughs> the dramatically gifted one. It's not. It's about every single one of us listening to the Holy Spirit. Yes? Okay, cool. Second thing, Paul says, it's really important, I'm going to speed up a bit now. Um, he says to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Actually, do you know the phrase? Can we move it on? Sorry. Um, oh, God, you can see that picture. It's a winter sky from Winter Watch. Right? Um, he says the phrase um, um, for the common good is a dodgy translation. It's kind of right, but it's not right. The word that is used is symphoron. Nothing to do with symphony, totally different meaning, I checked, trust me. But it, pharaoh means bear, and it's used over and over and over and over and over again in John 15, which as you all know, I am the vine, I am the true vine, you are the branches. Anyone who's plugged into me, rooted into me, um, will bear fruit. So this is a gift that is given, the Holy Spirit is given to us for each other. For the benefit or the profit, as the King James, prophet F-I-T, the King James Version says, the profit of one another. So for you to diminish what God has given you is to diminish the church. Every little thing that he's given you is for the church. And just in case you've forgotten, Jesus says in John 3, verse 34, God gives us the spirit without measure. I think sometimes some Christians, they say, Lord, yes, give me the Holy Spirit. And then they pull their hands away. Whereas, in fact, as Juliet had us again prophetically this morning, it's about holding your hands and waiting for him to fill that to overflowing. And that's what he will do. Okay, moving on really quickly. He also says, when we're baptised, in water obviously, we're baptised into one body by the Spirit, not by the vicar or the priest or the pastor or the minister, 
or the Apostle, were baptised by the Spirit. His living water brings us life. And actually, the word that is used there is absolutely unpronounceable, unless you're Greek. I'm going to have a go. Epotis men. It literally means an irrigation system. Well watered. Continually, constantly irrigated. It can also mean to drink deeply of a constant supply of water. So basically Paul is saying the spirit births us into the church and then gives us life for life. Gives us life for the ongoing of our lives. He energizes and activates us. And at the beginning of our service when we lit the candle and remembered all of those people who have contributed to our lives. They help irrigate our lives by allowing the Holy Spirit to work through them in the way that the Holy Spirit wanted to. So here we are, almost coming into land. Next one, Angie. The charismatic is quite simply rediscovering. It's not new. It's rediscovering our God-given spirit activated connection to Christ. That's the shortest sentence I could come up with. It's a rediscovery of what God in Christ has breathed into us, has given to each one of us who bear his name and call him Lord. It's a rediscovery of that spirit which activates in us our connection to Jesus. And that can happen when you're in the bath or the shower or going for a walk around the lake. It can happen when you're in the queue at the supermarket, in the petrol station, when you're talking to your beloved. It can happen anywhere because the Spirit is in you and seeks to grow that connection in you. So connect, we say our vision at the beginning bit of our very, very long vision statement is we see this Spirit-filled worshipping community. It goes on to say lots of other things, but that's what it says. That's who the leadership are seeing when they look at you. When we look at you, we are seeing a spirit-filled, worshipping community. We want to see you literally overflowing in an abundance of that spirit and an excited rediscovery of him at work in your life. And maybe some new discoveries of how he wants to work in your life. Are you up for that? Are you up for that? Because I know I am. It, it's really, really interesting that what I think online you can probably see this slide better than the people here because it says I am here, which is what God is saying to us. I am here. But actually the actual slide next to I am here says where are you? <laughs> which is where we started. And it's impossible to actually see it on the slide because of the, the colours that are in use. But I am here, says God, where are you? I am here, where are you? Do we understand? I'm sure we do, don't we? That regardless of whoever it is standing at the front, and regardless of however the message is being put across, God is here. And his first question, the first question in the Bible, where are you? Where are you? We are called to be a people of God's presence. A people who are clearly, intentionally, actively seeking that presence. Making room for him so that he can move into somebody else's life and make his place there 